<laughs> this is a story that will always live with me for the rest of my life. My mother and father used to always take lengthy trips over the weekends to visit my grandparents in Ohio when we had lived in Michigan. We would drive about four hours, and we usually would get there by the evenings. My grandparents lived in a huge Victorian estate on top of a hill, surrounded by woods all around. The house had six bedrooms and was extremely spacious, so whenever we slept over, I got a room to myself on the second floor. At the time, my dad suffered from terrible sleepwalking episodes and they only seemed to trigger at this house. I can remember one night, I was sleeping in the room and had my window open. That was when I was awoken by soft sounds coming from outside of the window. It sounded like hymns and chanting, as if it was a lullaby. At first, I checked to see if the television from downstairs was accidentally left on, but it wasn't. I was starting to get really freaked out when I went back in my room, because I noticed my dad was walking towards the trail path into the woods. The house lights were shining bright enough so that I could see the woods well enough from the window. In a panic, I ran downstairs and outside as fast as I could and grabbed a flashlight, then chased after my dad into the woods. He had managed to walk so far into the path of the woods that we got to be a mile away and the further I went into the woods, the darker it got. We just kept getting further and further away from the house, and it was really starting to get cold and scary. I started to call out for my dad, shining the flashlight straight ahead in the now pitch black woods, when I had lost him. For a split moment, I felt someone whisper my name in my ear, and the rustling sounds of leaves behind me, as if someone was walking right behind me. For some reason, I thought maybe my dad was behind me instead. So I turned and pointed my flashlight, and there was nothing there. I kept going, and continued to look for my dad. That was when I once again heard a voice, but this time, in a low and guttural voice. I could have sworn I heard the voice say, let's play. At this point, I actually thought my dad was playing a practical joke, so then I yelled out to my dad and told him this isn't funny and to show himself. Even though the voice sounded nothing like him, I just kind of assumed, maybe to ease my mind in my panic state. Literally a split second later, I see cloudy mist and what looked like an orb hovering from the distance of the woods and slowing going in my direction from afar. It then disappeared. I heard my dad's far off distance scream, and I started running faster into the woods to try to locate him. When I finally found him, he had fallen into this well that none of the family had any idea had existed. I quickly helped my dad out of the well, and he had asked me what happened. I brought him back into the house and told him that he was sleepwalking and managed to wander into the woods. The creepiest part of this whole experience was this. He said that while he was sleepwalking, he had dreamt that a woman in pioneer clothing urged him to find her missing son in the woods. She told him to run to the well and he will find him. When my dad told me this, I told him about hearing some soft singing before I rushed into the woods to get him and that I heard voices and whispering into the woods. A couple days later, fascinated by the well that existed in the woods, we went to go see it in daylight. To my utter shock, we had made a gruesome discovery. We found what looked like human bones at the bottom of the well. We immediately called the police. They examined these bones, and we were able to confirm weeks later that they weren't animal remains, but human remains. We had the bones examined by a professional, and they believed that the bones belonged to a young boy who may have perished hundreds of years ago. 
my guess is in the early 1800s. I would like to state wholeheartedly that these events are in fact true. From my father's sleepwalking to the dream he had and the bones uncovered. It may sound a bit far-fetched, but I guess you'll have to take my word for it. This event happened in the 1970s, and I'm 70 years old now. This all happened when I was 17. I have a rather bizarre ghost story, or maybe it just appears that way to me since I've never experienced ghosts before. It was many years ago, when I was 14 years old, and spending a few weeks at her lake home. One night my friend and I decided to spend the night in the den, rather than our bedroom. The den has a lonely view of the lake, and has a wall of windows. It is a very large room. As we were in our sleeping bags, I noticed what looked like a man sitting in the armchair. The apparition was black. You could not distinguish any features, but you could see a bowler hat or a similar hat on his head. He just sat there and didn't move, his arms resting on the chair. I was paralyzed with fear. I eventually mentioned this to my friend, or maybe she mentioned it to me first. I just remember that after a long time, we started talking about our late night visitor. We compared notes on what we were seeing, and it became apparent that we were both seeing the same thing. A shadow? I think not, and if you read on, you will know why I'm so sure. My friend and I became so scared that we buried ourselves in our sleeping bags and held on to each other for dear life. We knew we had to get out of there, but we were too scared to move. Eventually we got up our nerve and made a mad dash to the bathroom. Keep in mind, our lake house is quite large and the bathroom was not nearby. We huddled in the bathroom for some time and got up our nerve to make it to our bedroom. This time, for some reason, we didn't run. As we were making our way to the bedroom, we saw another apparition on the living room sofa. This was definitely no shadow. There were no windows in this room, therefore no light except the bathroom light. This apparition was easier to see. It was a woman from the turn of the century. She was dressed in a white dress, possibly a Victorian wedding gown, and lying in the pose of a deceased person. As you could imagine, we hightailed it to our bedroom. When in the bedroom, we sat up with the light on. I'm not sure how much time passed, but eventually, we heard what appeared to be a marching band playing. We looked at the clock and saw that it was after 3 a.m., and therefore, highly unlikely that a marching band would be performing in this rather sleepy like community. Had it not been for this, we would have considered it as teenage imaginations going wild. You can see things, but hearing them is an entirely different story. In the morning we checked out the house, to see if there was any way music could be played by itself in the house. We found an old radio down in the basement, but it wasn't plugged in. We then plugged in the radio, and it did not even work. We asked my grandparents if they had heard anything. And they said they had it. When we told them our stories, they just laughed. And almost everybody else we had told this to laughs also. If they don't laugh, they listen and nod their heads. But we can tell they are just being considerate and patronizing us. We are now both 30 years old, born a day apart, and live over a thousand miles apart. When we are together, we still talk about this and stand by our story and memory. We still agree about what we saw and heard. I have no explanation about this, but I will not sleep alone in this house. I don't even visit often, but when I do, I'm still scared to death. Seabrook, Toddville Road, the former Toddville Mansion 
which has recently been torn down. The property turned into apartments or condos. Reports of a strange creature roaming the grounds, noises, feelings of being watched, shadowy figures. Actually, this mansion was the List Mansion. The story of this place was well known to the people of Seabrook, who lived there at the time. I lived near the List Mansion for many years. Several acres of land were bought by a Houston business owner in the late 70s to early 80s, right on Galveston Bay, near the intersection of Toddsville Road and East Meyer Road. Bill List was his name, and for the most part at first, no one knew who he was, only that there was a major construction project going up near the bay. Bill List owned a trailer manufacturing business, and with the success of his business came great wealth. The mansion was a massive undertaking, built up on several feet of soil. The three-story brick structure dwarfed the modest home surrounding the property. The brick foundry, where Bill was buying the bricks for his mansion, was unable to keep up production of bricks for the mansion and bricks for other products. So Bill just bought the brick foundry so all the bricks made could go into his construction for project. Month by month, the mansion began to take shape. The stark brick structure was three stories tall, four if you count the massive garage on the ground level. All the windows on every floor featured wrought iron bars. It was divided into two separate sections, with a large glassed in garden and pool. Catwalks on the second floor crossed from the front of the house to the back part. The rooms were arranged into two separate apartments, with kitchens, bathrooms, and living areas. The entire property was surrounded by a brick wall from Toddville Road. The List Mansion, as it was called, resembled a prison, which was not far from true. When construction was completed, me and some friends were in the Kroger parking lot in Seabrook when two guys a little older than us invited us to a big party to celebrate the opening of the List Mansion. We talked to them for a few minutes, and then they left. We did not go to the party. For years after that, you rarely saw anyone coming or going from the mansion, even though several families could live there at the same time and never see each other. The guys we saw at Kroger that day never showed up anywhere in town. Then one day, Bill List was dead, murdered, and the whole story came out in the Daily Citizen, the Bay Area newspaper. The List Mansion was built like a prison, not to keep people out, but to keep people in. As it turns out, Bill List had a preference for younger men and would cruise the alleyways in parts of Houston where runaways would frequent. He would offer them a place to stay and drugs in return for his indulgence for the young men. Bill would keep them drugged and locked in the mansion, providing everything for them but freedom. Some would stay, and others would eventually be let go, but it was the final group of guys who figured it all out. They decided that Bill List must die, so one day, they got a hold of a shotgun and waited for Bill to come home from work. Bill never made it up the stairs from the garage before he was shot and killed. The guys who killed him ransacked the mansion, stole Bill's credit cards, and left. Some were picked up on their way to Canada. Others were caught in the Houston area. For years after the death of Bill List, the mansion was up for sale, and yet no one would buy it. Caretakers were brought in to maintain the property, and eventually, a bunch of people at a rock and roll band rented it for a while. I moved from Seabrook in the early 90s. Eventually, the List mansion was bought by a real estate land developer, and he tore down the List mansion. In its place was built Suko condos with clay tile roofs. There is nothing left of the List Mansion except the sordid stories of the long residents of Seabrook. These are my memories of the List Mansion. I grew up in a small town, and for about a year, we lived in a haunted house when I was just two years old. In other words, I don't remember specific things, just feelings. 
It all started when my mother and father moved from South Carolina to Kentucky. They rented an old house with a huge basement. This was told to me by my mother. I don't remember much about the house, so this is all secondhand information. They had lived there only about a month when my mother and older sister started to notice things. They told me that I was the focus of the spirit, as it would do things to me or around me. Here's a few of the things that happened to me when I was little. One time, my mother and sister was sitting in the living room watching TV. I had a little wooden rocking chair that I loved to sit in. My father was at work working a night shift in the coal mines. Mom said, all of a sudden, things got very cold and my little rocking chair started rocking very fast and the rocking tossed me out onto the floor. Then, the chair fell backwards against the wall, with no one in it by the way, and my mother and sister both heard a very dull laughing. My mother said that the thing in the house would push me, and a few times when she was watching me play on the front porch, would pick me up and drop me down hard on the ground. My mother says that she was terrified to leave me alone. Then another time. My big sister and her best friend were playing with me in the front yard, and my mother said she heard them screaming for her. When she went out in the yard, my sister and her friend was holding on to me and crying. I was trying to go down the little hill, into a little field below our house, begging to go play with it. My sister to this day swears that she and her friend saw a big black figure hiding behind a tree and motioning for me to come to it. And what was scary was, was that I was going. My sister's friend refused to come visit her at her house after that episode. My mother told me that I told her its name. I won't repeat it here, for it makes me have anxiety attacks, and that I lived in a deep dark hole in the ground, down in the field below our house. My mother went looking for a hole in the ground, and she found an old well that had been boarded up, and the weeds grown over it pretty bad, so it was very difficult to see. She didn't tell me if she experienced anything there or not, but she wouldn't talk about it with me. She kept begging my father to move. My mother said I would laugh at her, and she was constantly scared. Finally, one night when my dad was home, something happened that made my dad rethink and take my mother seriously. My parents were in bed, and it was pretty late. My father looked up and noticed the shadow of someone staring at him in the darkness. My dad at first thought it was my sister, so he raised up and asked her what was wrong. The thing laughed, and my mother screamed that it wasn't my sister because the shadow was too big to be my sister. When she screamed, my dad jumped up to turn on the lights, and it laughed again and disappeared. From then on, my dad took what my mother said seriously. After a while, my dad was able to buy a piece of land, and we moved, and according to my mother, not a minute too soon. To this day, my mother refuses to talk about it. I didn't find out about this until years later, when I was watching TV about 15 years old or so. I saw a commercial for cat food with the same name of the thing that had haunted us for years before. I had no idea about this because my mother didn't tell me about it until afterwards. As soon as I heard the commercial and some of the cat food, I had an anxiety attack. When I told my mother what happened, she turned very pale and told me some of the story, some history of the house after we moved out. There was a man and his daughter who moved into the house. He was a single father, so he had his mother move into the house with him to help him take care of his daughter while he worked. Within two years of them living there, the man went crazy and one night killed himself with a gun. The daughter and her grandmother moved out of the night of a suicide and moved away to another state. No one ever lived in the house again. It stood empty for years and the house started falling apart. 
The owner had since died a long time ago, and everyone just sort of ignored the old house. My mother never told anyone of our experiences. Finally, about six or seven years ago, they tore down the house in the basement and they built a community fire department on the property. That building isn't exactly where the house was. It stands about 30 or so feet from where the original house stood. Anyway, that is my story. I've had other experiences as an adult, but I will save those for another day. Thanks for listening. Hey Phantoms, welcome to a new month and welcome to another celebration of ghost stories you probably didn't hear. Maybe you heard them, but at any rate, go ahead and take the time to comment, like, share, and subscribe. Sing it like a song and maybe it'll, fun, it'll be more fun for you to do. Of course, I messed up when I was trying to act all silly, but it doesn't matter because I'm a silly people, man. I don't know what that means. Guys, okay, uh, thank you so much for tuning in again. Like I said, please take the opportunity to comment and enjoy the stories. Uh, let me know in the comment section below what story you love the most and why you like it. And I'll respond to it to the best of my ability when I'm available and when I can do it, which is probably usually all the time. But you know what I mean. I'm actually going to be away from home for a couple weeks by the time this video is released. So just take care of the video and make sure it's getting shared around because God knows what happens if it doesn't get shared around and people are like, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, by people, I mean Google, but you know what I mean. Google wants to restrict everybody from being successful on YouTube. But you know what? We'll be successful by sharing these ghost stories. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyway, yeah, just ignore my silly babble. It's so incoherent at this point that you guys are so used to it, but it really never, ever actually makes sense. So I'm going to leave you guys, and remember, everybody can make a difference as long as you look up to the sky and see the sky turning blue, which it always is blue, so that means you can always make a difference. Okay, bye. Guys, oh, I kind of ended that awkwardly. Oh well, love you.